going on at home and in our cupboards um, and taking over our screens. Next up is Stephanie Devine, who is, who is Devine. She is still, I think, the only um, business in the world to have, be manufacturing and selling completely compostable zero waste bras. So with that, can I introduce everyone to Stephanie Devine? Thanks, James. Hello. Now I can do my screen share. <laughs> Does that work? Perfectly. <laughs> Good. I'm new to the technology. So um, amazing watching everybody this morning, particularly after I watched, washed my hair with an ethic bar last night and um, learning so more, much more about Patch and about beer. Just, and I'm really honoured to be part of this, this programme and... I have to say that, you know, four years ago, if you told me that um, I was going to be here talking about a zero waste bra or a circular economy bra, I wouldn't have believed you because four years ago, I actually didn't know what the circular economy was. So my, my journey into this um, started a long time ago. Four years ago in June, I was actually putting my first bra business into, into liquidation um, but the story goes back a lot longer. So, so I'd always loved lingerie as, um, as I was growing up and I worked in fashion in my teens. Um, but then I had a corporate career in London, which afforded me a good lifestyle and which in the end brought me to Australia in, uh, 1995. And, um, it wasn't something that I loved. I enjoyed it. Um, it didn't feel like a, a burning purpose, but it felt like it was what I did and I was good at it and I couldn't necessarily see a way out of it. Um, and the way that that change came was, was very unexpected and, and very, um, unwanted really because I was diagnosed with breast cancer in late 2006 and I was diagnosed on a Friday afternoon and I was booked in for hospital on Monday morning and one of the things I needed was a non-wide bra in a natural fibre to see me through treatment and so I, I dashed off to uh, a local department store and the only ones that I could find there in, in a proper cup size that weren't small, medium and large um, were maternity bras, which are lined with organic, or lined with cotton, and sports bras. And I'd just been told that I'd never have kids after chemo. And so the idea of, of wearing a, a, a maternity bra was, was very, very confronting for me, obviously. Um, and I ended up buying some sports bras. And, and I felt that as a woman and as a consumer, I'd completely fallen off the map. And it was something that hit me very hard at that time, being a young woman. Um, so going through the treatment, you know, in particular, it's a time where your sense of identity disappears with your hair and your eyebrows and your eyelashes and to have to wear something that you then wouldn't choose to wear in ordinary life, like a sports bra, just really, just really adds insult to injury. Um, it gave me a massive motivation to, to want to change that if I had the opportunity going forward. Um, and also going through treatment, you are very aware of um, toxins and what you're putting into your body and what you're having sitting next to your body. And um, it got me looking at, at products uh, in a whole new forensic way. So I, it sat with me a few years later after treatment. I, I still struggled and I'd just flown in on a long haul flight. It was summer in, in Australia. It was really hot. I was puffy and swollen and I had scar tissue and it was all awkward. And I found myself in a, another beautiful boutique lingerie store. Um, and again, in front of the maternity bra section, all these beautiful bras lined with cotton, non-wired. And I, I explained my situation to the shop assistant and um, she said, there's nothing for people like you, <laughs> which for obvious reasons is a line that I will never forget. And I'm sure she didn't mean to offend me, but again, I felt like as a woman and as a consumer, I've just ceased to exist. So um, it took really for me to get to five years, because when you go through cancer, you, you know, the idea is that if you get to five years, you, you've got through it. So when it got to five years, um, I started in earnest working with some friends who worked in the lingerie industry and I was absolutely obsessed with the idea of making the perfect non-wide bra. 
Um, I wanted it to be in proper cup sizes because I don't know any woman who is a small, medium and large. And I wanted it to be lined with organic cotton so that it was quietly fit for purpose for a woman going through breast cancer, but not a cancer bra because nobody really wants to associate with the idea when they're going through it. So I set up a company called Bras Without Wires um, and I was lucky enough to be fast tracked in 2014 to the semi-finals of Livestrong's inaugural um, Big C competition, which was about improving innovations that improve the life of, of people going through cancer. Um, and it was, I was very proud to, to get into that. And on the back of that, I secured a backer and in 2015, I went into, into business full time uh, of making bars. So cut back to four years later, June, 2016, and my relationship with the backer had quickly failed. And I was forced to liquidate that business in June of 2016. And having had that enormous journey, which was so personal for me <laughs> over a 10 year period, I felt like it was just the biggest failure of my life. I felt like I'd never achieve anything ever again, that I'd lost the best idea I'd ever had. And I was just absolutely, completely devastated and inconsolable. And it just so happened that that, that same week, the Sustainable Brands Conference was on in Sydney. And I happened to meet a fellow called Bert van Son, who runs um, the Dutch circular economy company, Mud Jeans. And I started to learn about the circular economy and what a brilliant idea it was. And I realized that perhaps there was a more important idea and that maybe there was a reason my first business had failed. And then in fact, this was the better idea that maybe I could actually make the world's first circular economy bra. So I started to look and research into the idea of the damage done, you know, particularly by fast fashion. Um, and I was horrified and I think that in Australia, because we have so much land and we can just bury things in deserts and nobody will know about them, which I think is what we do with our bottles at the moment. Um, we, we, we don't really focus on that. Whereas in the Netherlands, they're 30% below seawater. So for them, the idea of any kind of global warming and climate change and, and ocean, um, ocean elevation is, is huge issue. So um, it will annihilate their lifestyle. So, so the research that I did, I'm going to just share some of that with you now. So the early stages of research, the sorry, my slides have moved around. I'm so sorry, I've got the wrong thing here. There we are. We have to go back. I'm so good at this. Apologies, everyone. Just going to get this into here. So fashion is the second most polluting industry outside oil and gas. Now this actually turned out to be a statement that nobody really knows where it comes from. Is it true? We don't really know. The fact is it mobilized me into action and it's probably mobilized a bunch of other people into action. Um, and it, we know that it is, you know, we've all seen the films. We know that it is a filthy industry. And so I, it is one that really resonated with me. Um, when I learned about fast fashion, I learned that global production of fashion doubled between 2000 and 2015. And that by 2017, fashion was cheaper than it was 25 years earlier. On average, we wear a garment 36% less now than we did in 2000. So this is all really since the advent of, of real fast fashion, which we all loved and embraced when it came out. But, you know, we, we've learned as time has gone on. So the impact of fashion is is firstly on the land. Um, the average Australian buys 27 kilos of clothes a year and disposes of 23 kilos. That's 600,000 tonnes of textile waste that goes into landfill every year. And programmes like um, SBS's War on Waste have really highlighted that and I think brought that a lot to the fore in the last couple of years. That's 93 million tonnes of textile waste globally going into landfill. And so globally, 87% of textiles end up in landfill or are incinerated. And in Australia, it's 85%. So we're actually the second largest waster of textiles in the world, which is a really astonishing and quite frightening statistic. Um, I keep coming back to polyester. Polyester is my bugbear. Polyester is plastic, but over 60% of this is polyester, which lasts in landfill for over 200 years. So then we move on to the impact on the oceans. 
Um, the Guardian had a great article last year about how since 1945, plastic pollution has become part of our fossil record. Really since we started washing plastic, um, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation tells us that we release half a million tons of microplastics into the oceans every year. And that plastic um, becomes sediment, which then is, is recorded in the fossil record. So over 35% of, of all ocean microplastic is actually through washing synthetic clothes, polyester and nylon clothing, which is alarming. Um, and then in Forbes magazine last year, there was, there was an article about how sea anemones are eating plastic microfibers. And this photo here shows the highlighted fluorescent bits are, are actually pieces of microplastic within an anemone and obviously that gets into the food chain which means we're all eating microplastics at this point. So then we get on to the impact on, on the air. Um, when polyester is made the process releases nitrous oxide which is a greenhouse gas 300 times more harmful to the environment than carbon dioxide. Um, terrifying to think about. And when polyester ends up in landfill, again, it produces methane gas um, as it breaks down over 200 years. And as we know, methane gas contributes to climate change and that in turn drives bushfires that we've seen of late. So I could go on. I haven't even got to forests yet and to the deforestation that's down to um, the appetite for viscose based fibers. That's a whole other thing. But We'll, we'll get back to some nice stuff now. So here is a photo of a beautiful girl wearing a completely compostable bra. So this was our, our launch photo. So I wanted to, to do something about it. And when I started to look at the problem and realize how massive it was, I, I did a lot of research in circularity. And I, it was a problem with a bra because a bra is made from nine different materials. And they're very small pieces of things. Um, and they're all different materials and, and some things like elastic, when elastic's gone, it's just gone. Um, you can't make it into something else. Um, and apart from that, we're talking intimates, we're talking things which sit right next to your body. Um, and, and does anybody really want a recycled a garment that's been sitting as an intimate on someone else's body? Probably not. It became a huge issue. And I started to really feel like making a circular economy bra was you know, possibly impossible. But then at the end of 2016, Trump was elected as president of the United States and women started marching in the streets and women started burning their bras or there was talk of them burning their bras as they did in the 70s. In fact, they didn't in the 70s, but there is a great story of it. So I love this idea about the burning of bras and the Helen Reddy song. And, um, and then at the same time, I happened to be, uh, flying back from Europe at, from, from Christmas and I read this terrible story about how the poor people in Delhi were dying in their dozens because they were burning rubbish which was so toxic um, just to keep warm that it was actually killing them um, and the idea really crystallized in my mind that the bra that I made had to be so clean that it could be buried or burned or composted at end of life and leave no trace, leave no tra negative trace on, on the planet. So it, in terms of the bra that I was going to make, it had to be, it had to be botanically circular. So the next issue was going out and finding the materials. Um, the photo on the left is a tensile factory in Melbourne, fabulous family run business um, called MTK Textiles. And uh, Tensile was a bit of a no-brainer because tensile is made from eucalyptus trees. Uh, we buy Lensing tensile and Lensing was developed by a fellow called Mr. Lensing uh, in Austria in the 1940s. And he developed a process whereby uh, tensile could be processed in a 99% closed loop process, which means that all of the material, all of the, the chemicals in the water can be recaptured and recycled and reused again in, in the next um, the next iteration. So tensile was a, a really good choice because it's a beautiful fabric. We couldn't have spandex in it, but we have a mechanical knit in a, a mechanical stretch in a knit and we had to rely on that. The next thing was elastic. Elastic was very complicated. So it's almost impossible to find um, 
a botanically sourced elastic or, or compostable elastic, most elastic, 99.9% .9 is nylon or polyester. Um, eventually I found a woman in the Netherlands who um, is, is an agent for a number of ecologically sound uh, uh, materials and she had an elastic which was made from tree rubber which, was, uh, which came from sustainably managed plantations in the Philippines uh, that was then knitted into organic cotton by a company in Austria, excuse me, and she um, it was then, it was actually a, um, a commercially developed product, but a woman in Germany who was making her own kids wear had decided she wanted a clean elastic and she then created a product that could be used in clothing uh, using this tree rubber and organic cotton elastic. So I managed to find that. Um, I have to say that it was, it was difficult getting the attention of, of this woman. I, I, in, in 2017, I just couldn't get people to take me seriously that this is what I wanted to do. And obviously dealing with different time zones, it became very complicated. So in the end, what I had to do was say, right, I'm gonna be in your office the next Thursday at 10 o'clock. And I actually flew over to Europe. I was seeing my family too, but I flew over there and I got a train from Amsterdam to the border of Belgium and I turned up in her office and we went through everything and I bought her product and we've had a good relationship ever since. But I find in this process that to be taken seriously, you've, you've really got to turn up, uh, which is what I had to do. So the other, the other components, we found a um, cradle to cradle tensile sewing thread, uh, which is already there out of Switzerland. Initially we used pad print, print inks um, because that's a very um, sustainable way of, of, of creating a, a label. But then we've since moved on to uh, organic cotton labels printed with soy inks out of the Netherlands. At the time, it was hard to find poly bags that weren't plastic, and I managed to find a company in Israel that manufactured in France, and that's how I got to all of that. The big challenge then was the hooks and eyes. The hooks and eyes almost killed me. So it's, this is just something that hasn't been created before for another bra, a, a compostable hook and eye. So I worked very closely with my factory in China who, um, despite what people think about China, you know, these are young people, they have young kids, they understand what the problems are with pollution and with um, sustainability and they want to be part of the solution. And they work really hard with me um, creating hooks and eyes and they come back with something and say, well, it's just got a little bit of a little bit of glue or a little bit of laminate and I'd have to say well it's just a little bit too much glue or a little bit too much laminate for me and I had to um, I had to reject them and it was hard at this point we were getting to the point where the, the Kickstarter was about to, to launch and I really didn't have a solution for this product because I didn't I had no idea it was going to be quite this hard um, and then one day I was watching Mad Men and I saw Betty Draper and she was wearing one of those great 1950s, 60s bras. And I thought, I bet they didn't have glue and laminate in, in that time. And I realized that what I needed to do was go back to the, go back to the beginning really of, of, of lingerie making and go back to those more traditional companies in Europe. Um, and I found a company in France that I'd actually met once before who agreed that if I sent him the organic cotton material, they could make um, hooks and eyes in the size and the quantity that I wanted. So that was great, um, ticked. And then I got the fabric there, the Kickstarter was going, and I suddenly realized I hadn't sent them any sewing thread. And I was in a panic and I thought, this is so hard, shall I just leave it? Who would know? And I thought, no, no, no. I would know, and I've just been so dogged about everything, I just couldn't live with myself if I knew it was being sewn with polyester thread. So I emailed them. Sure enough, they started production, and yes, they were going to use polyester thread. And I said, well, no, you have to stop. We have to start again. And they said, no, we can't, it's too late. And I sent them then all of the press that, that we were getting about how this is the first compostable bra, and, and we had over 70 press articles. And eventually the MD came back and said, okay, we'll wait. And I sent them, I, I ordered some, some of the black sewing thread, the tensile sewing thread, sent it to them. It delayed the production by two weeks, but it was something that just had to be done. So eventually we got the hooks and eyes made and they look beautiful. There's a little bit more to that story, which I'll probably come to later. But then came to launching the Kickstarter. So this was a very exciting time. Um, uh, as Brianne said earlier, 
you know, crowdfunding is a great way actually really for marketing. And because we had to delay the launch so many times, we actually built up a really good head of steam. And it was, it was very gratifying personally because you, you've been working so hard on this project. And I kind of think, you know, my friends probably thought I was bonkers trying to make a compostable bra. Why? I think you're actually crazy. So then to have the idea so well received and, and just to give you an idea, we, had, we just had a target of 20,000 to go into production and we got that within 48 hours. And then the, the project went on to raise um, over 350% of, of that over the 30 day period, which was incredibly um, humbling and exciting. And just to see that so many people all over the world, and we sold to 30 countries, cared also so much about making clothing that stayed out of landfill um, and that was, was absolutely sustainable and clean as a whistle was, um, was a great revelation. We were lucky in that, um, again, managed to get heaps of press um, and it almost kind of got viral in, in, a, in a way we, we find articles and, and we didn't know where they come from. People were just picking up the story from other, from other publications because people, people love the idea so much. So, so we got through that. I mean, the, the next part, the manufacturing, I think, as, as Brianne said, there's a lot of hidden costs in there. And in the end, I just had so much to learn that um, I didn't make any money out of that. I probably just about broke even in the end. Uh, but I learned a massive amount, you know, particularly given that I didn't come to this as a, as a manufacturer of bras. I came to it as a frustrated consumer. Um, it was it was an extraordinary learning process and and I knew that I was onto something with the level of support and also the fact that you know incredibly beautiful um, people who were much more photogenic than me were really happy to be photographed in in the bra so on the left we've got Laura Wells who is a fabulous marine biologist and also a model obviously um, she she has her own um, National Geographic show and she's a real pioneer, pioneer when it comes to the health of the ocean. So to get her in the bar was a great uh, dream come true. Uh, and she came in early on that. And then on the back of that, turns out that Laura used to flat with Robin Lawley in New York. And, and uh, we managed to reach out to Robin and she's a huge, well, she's again, a pioneer in the industry the only plus size model to grace the cover of Italian Vogue, um, you know, is a six foot two Amazonian. And she is very passionate about soil uh, and also vegan. So Robin also did a beautiful photo shoot for us. And you can see, you know, if people think a compostable bra is not going to be something that's very attractive, you know, we had ideas, <laughs> we have the images to prove that that is not necessarily the case. So, love these images, love these girls, but the, the bra photo that I, I love most, my favorite bra shot, is probably the worm shot. So in March, 2019, I um, was up in cotton country uh, with Cotton Australia, where I happened to meet a company called Worm Tech. And Worm Tech's a commercial worming enterprise attached to the ginning side of cotton manufacturing, cotton processing. And they agreed that if I gave them a tensile bra, they would put it into their worm farm. So it went in on the 18th of March and um, Shane took these photos on the 8th. You can kind of see that it's, it's starting to break down and, and get into holes. The worm's quite liking that. He then hurt his leg. And so he didn't go back there till the 18th of, of May. And then all that was left at that point was the straps, which was unbelievable. Everything else had just completely disappeared. And we put the straps into a compost heated and that was gone within another six weeks completely. So it was just so exciting to prove what I'd always hoped that we can create things that can actually be buried or composted at the end of life. You know, we don't have to make everything out of polyester. If we choose properly, if we choose those materials properly, we can we can create things that compost. So I've also had Dr. Oliver Knox um, at the University of New England in Armadale attempt to soilings of um, the bra uh, as part of his wonderful Soil My Undies program. But unfortunately we were hit um, late last year with stage four water restrictions, which meant there's not enough moisture in the soil to, to break anything down. 
Um, and then of course this year we've got COVID-19, so they can't fit enough people into the greenhouses to actually make that happen. And they're, they're trying to do some time-lapse photography on it, which will be incredible. Um, but we've just been a bit thwarted. We'll get there. But the idea is that if you don't have a worm farm or a compost, you can actually then just bury it in your garden and we can see how that works uh, to make sure it just disappears. So back to these beautiful young ladies. A uh, question I'm often asked is, is it durable? You know, if it's compostable, is it going to break down quickly on the body? And the answer is absolutely not. So Tencel is a really premium fiber. It's, um, you're probably wearing it in, hopefully in some of your clothes at the moment. It's very silky. It's very expensive. It's very durable. It's antibacterial and also has hypoallergenic pro properties. It's, it's often used in post-surgical wear because it's so clean. Um, organic cotton, you, you're all wearing organic cotton t-shirts and jeans. So on your organic cotton bra, same thing. You know, you're wearing it, expect to wear it for years, expect to wash it for years. Elastic, the elastic is very durable. It was actually uh, an industrial elastic when it started out life. So it lasts a long time. Any elastic will, will go after time. Huffington Post says you can only keep a bra for um, three to six months. Our bras last a, long, a lot longer than that. I've had somebody show me one, which the elastic had gone quite cool. Well, I mean, it was a bit messy, but it turned out she'd been wearing it every day for a year and just washing it and putting it straight back on. So elastic has a limited love life, shelf life, but it's the, the, the components are super durable. So to the friend who asked, the male friend who asked if you were wearing the bra lying on damp lawn for a period of a couple of hours, was it going to break down? The answer is absolutely definitely no. It will break down if it goes into somewhere that's dark and moist and has the right temperature or has hungry worms there. Um, everything will break down. It's, it's, it's all plant-based material and um, it breaks down easily into nature. Um, unlike polyester, which is going to sit around forever. So why bras? I mean, why is it such a big thing? A, a, a neighbour of mine, he's a very bright documentary maker, said to me one day, again, Mel, why is it important that women's bras are compostable? To which point I said, well, it's important that everything is compostable. But actually, bras, one of the little things, the average woman owns nine bras, apparently. If we assume conservatively that two of the seven and a half billion women on the planet wear a bra, um, then that's 18 billion bras headed for landfill. And they're mostly made of nylon and polyester. I mean, almost 100% made of nylon and polyester. When we got to selling a thousand bras last year, it was a hundred kilos. And I worked out that a hundred kilos is actually the weight of a baby elephant. So I'm pleased to say that we have now saved the weight of about three baby elephants um, of toxic bras going into to landfill. Um, we're working towards a full elephant, but a full elephant actually weighs 5,000 kilos. So it's a bit of a stretch goal for 2021. What keeps me going is, is really thinking that every, or hoping that every bra that I sell saves its toxic equivalent from going into landfill. Um, and that feels like something of an achievement. Because what really worries me and is, is a lot on my mind is, is, is this idea that if everyone who made anything was responsible for its products at end of life, the world would be a very different place. And so for many companies, responsibility for the product ends at the sale. And as we all know, it's very easy to make something that's very cheap out of cheap materials using cheap labor the cost of that is what happens after it's, after it's finished and the cost of it, um, of disposing of it, and if it going into landfill and if it's sitting around there for 200 years and creating methane gas, that's where the cost is. And so it's really important to me, this idea that we, we take responsibility for what we make and 80% of a product's um, sustainable credentials are, are in the design phase and in the material phase. So I think everybody has to be mindful of, <coughs> excuse me, of, of the materials they're using. So, sorry, just a glass of water. What's next for us? <clears throat> we are coming up to, we're still in our first two years. Um, <clears throat> but last year we launched our new bras in organic cotton. The one on the left is um, the, uh, or vintage peach. Uh, we also launched Twilight, uh, which landed this year in, um, in March. 
Um, we've had great reviews on all the bras, on the tensile and the cotton bras. Uh, we find that 50% of our customers actually come back and buy more bras in a different color uh, or a different style, so which is fantastic. And I'm pleased to say that sales with both existing and new customers continue to grow. And I think that's because at the end of the day, yes, it's a compostable bra, but it's also a, a wire-free, super comfortable bra. And once women go wire free, they, they rarely go back to the wire. They, it's a revelation. I think our generation is brought up to believe that bras have wires and nobody really knows why. It's just because that's what they have. We did some research many years ago which showed that 74% of women will prefer to wear a non-wide bra if it offered the same support. And 62% of women take their bra off the first thing they do when they get home. Um, now, as we're all working at home from now, uh, it's, there's no reason why you shouldn't be trialing a non-wire bra. We're also unique in making 27 sizes. Um, it was always my aim to offer non-wire bras in the same size range as wire bras were there. We actually make much more of a size range than, than most other brands that, that are much more selective in, in the wide range. Um, we continue to launch via uh, new products via pre-sale, which funds our production, but also really importantly, it means that we don't overproduce. So we pre-sell for 30 days at a discounted rate. So customers are rewarded for backing us at early stage. And then that's the only way that given we have 27 sizes, it's the only way you can lock in your size because we'll make additional production. It gives us our size distribution. Um, so that we're, we're careful about not over making in the sizes that haven't sold so well. We will make more in those sizes to sell on the site, but if we, you know, we ended up on the project last year and we just sold out of everything in about an hour, which was fantastic. But if we have a newspaper appearance or, or anything, that can limit the sizes. So the only way to lock in your sizes is to, to back the crowdfund. Um, we don't want to end up with any excess stock at any point. We do not want to be incinerating or landfilling very good bras. So we're, we're trying to stick to make as many as we think we will, we will actually sell. The most exciting thing of this year for us is a new collaboration with Liberty of London, and this is the print on the right. So I've been working with a local rep of Liberty of London and talking for a couple of years now, and I wasn't particularly keen on using a BCI cotton. I wanted to use an organic cotton. And Liberty of London have now created an organic cotton in a weight that we can use in the, the very good bra. And so we've made our samples. We're actually doing a shoot tomorrow. Um, and I hope to launch that, if not later this month, then next month. It's all a bit tricky, obviously, with COVID-19. Um, but I think it's the best bra we've ever made. It's a new design. It's got a V-wire on the front. It works really well, particularly in the larger sizes. Um, Liberty is excited about it. It's a good thing for them. And hopefully they might stock it in the store if it opens again. Um, so that's... That's something that I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about. We also, as a business, are just done in production. It's supposed to be this week, it's going to be next week now, with a new factory in Sri Lanka. Um, I've always made in China in the past, and then we had issues with the Hong Kong demonstrations last year, which I fully understand, and then COVID this year, so I moved to Sri Lanka. They're a bigger factory. Um, we are a very tiny client for them, but what's great for me with that is that the larger factories have to have a higher transparency and have accreditations in terms of the people who work there and the welfare, the social welfare of those people. Um, I felt again that this was a, a, a factory that wasn't necessarily that keen because we were so tiny. And, you know, given my experience with the Dutch, what I did was I got myself over to Sri Lanka in December last year, and I met the people involved. I wasn't 100% convinced that they really, really wanted it. And then the chairman's son came in to the meeting and it's a family business, very close family business. And the chairman's son had actually done his thesis on Patagonia. And he loved the idea of the very good bar. He, we spent hours talking about sustainability. We wanted to have lunch. And he, he's really single-handedly been responsible for ensuring that the very good bra even as tiny as it is compared to the global brands that they make, is going to be made within that factory. So I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about that. I think it's an, a huge opportunity for us. And I think it's also an opportunity for them. And I think they see that. And my big hope is that, you know, because they work with big brands, some of the tiny things that we do that, that might make an impact on those brands, like even down to packaging or down to sewing thread or, you know, this, the eco-elastics that we use, 
if the bigger brands start using that and we can start, you know, by way of the factory influencing that, then that's going to be um, a really, really great outcome. So, so yeah, that's, um, that's where we are to date. Still a lot smaller and younger than those other companies out there, but that's where we are. Jen, are you there? I am. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, there's a few questions there. Can you see them? No, I can't. Um, um, let me just find, oh, that's not what I want. Uh, let me find my chat box. I do have a chat box, but I can only see you privately. I can't see anybody else in there. You and I down the bottom of the screen. Oh, yes, I can, of course. I'd hidden it. Of course I can. Right, so I'll start uh, with the first question then. Thank you. So planning on go, are we planning to go into retail stores? Um, everybody asks me this. It's so hard to buy a bar online. I fully understand that. At the moment, we don't have a pricing structure where it will work. Um, our components are so expensive. The materials we buy are so expensive. And then the cost of making is expensive because we don't have huge quantities that I just cannot find a way to make the model work right now um, in a way that the retail stores can put, you know, between 100 and 150% markup plus in the UK, their, their VAT is 20%. And we just can't make a bra um, that would even, that would make any money. We'd make a loss on selling that product within a, in a, whole, in a wholesale way. So I, I'm working on it. Gradually the price of components come down as time goes on and, and I would like to. I'm glad at the moment that we don't because I feel so sorry for my friends that, you know, their business, wholesale business has become a huge thing. Right now with COVID-19, I feel so lucky that we're just business to consumer. But yes, I would love to go into retail stores as we get bigger and as we can grow. Um, so that is an ambition, ambition over time. Um, Next question is, how do we make complex colors without chemicals? There are chemicals. Um, we use GOTS dyes. So our suppliers are ABMT and MTK in Melbourne for the cotton and the tensile. They use GOTS dyes, which is the Global Organic Textile Standard, um, which, you know, isn't for everybody, but, but it's, it is the organic the global organic standard and that's what we have to adhere to. At the end of the day, the product has to function as a product. So I've had people who've been interested in, in a style with vegetable dyes and we did buy some, just one little piece of a liner that we use, which is a rigid cotton from, from India last year and it's dyed with vegetable dyes. But we had to wash it three times, it kept running. Um, it just wasn't stable enough. And so for now we stick with, with um, the GOTS dyes. Liberty of London uses REACH dyes, which is a big global standard, um, which, you know, you can do your own research on that. It's, um, it's a very high standard. It's, you know, it's not organic, but it's, it's the highest possible standard in terms of chemicals. And I know it's been quite controversial because some of the smaller manufacturers in Europe, it's too expensive to use those dyes. But for somebody like Liberty of London, they can do that. So I do obviously rely on my suppliers to, to ensure that they're adhering to those standards of, of GOTS and REACH. Um, can I just um, ask you to elaborate yeah. for people who um, are, are interested? You, you sound like you're apologising a little for the GOT standard cottons. Mm. That, what, what's the reason for that? Well, only I just had one person saying, you know, GOT isn't as good as vegetable dyes. There are still chemicals involved. And, you know, there are chemicals involved. But I think, I think what many people think about about this type of business is that it's very black and black or white and you can't get absolutely everything 100% clear which is why I, I say that we're zero zero waste but we're not zero waste because we're zero post-production waste I actually can't account for what happens in the factory I can use a factory that says it's it's using recycled electricity and water but unless I'm actually there during the production for the whole time I can't verify that so I think we have to to a degree go on faith. And I, I, I believe that GOTS dye is, is, is great. Um, and I think for a product that has to function, we have to use something. An, an eco or sustainable product can't function at a lesser level than a conventional product. It has to function the same way. Um, so yes, that's why I'm, I don't mean to apologize for GOTS. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, um, 
Yes, COVID-19, enormous challenges. I mean, who saw that coming? So, uh, yes, um, I, I actually, you know, I was in Sri Lanka in December. I, I had had issues in China because my, my merchandisers are in Hong Kong and that gave us delays last year. So when COVID kicked in in China in, uh, in January this year, I thought, amazing, I, I'm going to use this factory in Sri Lanka. We've already established a relationship. They've made samples. Fantastic. And then, of course, I also because sales have been growing for the first time, I just decided to back myself and I bought uh, and I don't have a financial backer. It's literally just me in my spare room, as you see. Um, I bought the uh, large quantities of, of products to beat the, the minimum quantities and the surcharges that go with that. So I bought more than double the amount of tinsel I would normally buy. I bought 24,000 meters of elastic because it's a minimum quantity of a new product out of Germany. And then, of course, Sri Lanka shut down on the 19th of March, and it has been closed ever since. Parts of it closed up this week. Um, I've had incredibly expensive stock that I've had to pay for, which I, I, you know, I wasn't entirely sure where in the world it was. I'm, I'm now glad to say that, that almost all of it is, is now in warehouses in, in Colombo, waiting for the factory to reopen. So that has been a huge issue in terms of you know the, the cash flow um, impact of that is enormous for a small business. Um, I was supposed to have stock at the end of this month. Now I hope I'll have stock at the end of March, sorry, at the end of um, yeah. June. Um, how I will get that stock out, I don't actually know. There are so few fl planes flying um, that we can only say, because people are pre-buying with us as well, they're doing it via pre-sale. So we have to say, well, we think it's gonna be here at the end of, June, beginning of July. If we can get it on an airplane, it'll be here at the beginning of July. If it has to go by sea, it won't be here until the end of August. So um, it's been a huge challenge. In terms of sales, our sales have remained very solid. I'm, I'm so lucky. It can be very lumpy, um, but we uh, April was one of our best months ever. And I do truly believe, you know, and to go to what James was saying, <laughs> Beer James was saying before, I think we will come out as will become as a more values-based society, I think, at the end of this. And I think that translates into people really caring much more about, you know, what they're, what they're buying. They're buying less and they want to make sure they buy better, which is great. Um, so I hope that's, um, I hope that's answered the last one. Next one from Jane. Thank you, Jane. Great work she's saying. Thank you. you take all the compliments we can get. Um, She's saying, I don't actually wear bras anymore. Are you making a singlet in the future? I have actually made some singlets. I did some sleepwear. Um, I still have some in stock. What I find is that people really, really want the extra stuff. They want a compostable singlet or a compostable pair of PJ bottoms. But in the end, they just don't buy. I think there are lots of choices out there that aren't compostable. But there are so many choices that they tend to... Um, they tend to want, you know, come to me less for those sorts of things. So they do sell over time, but yes, there are singlets there. And I'd love to do more. I'd like to do more basic t-shirts and um, things that are, you know, just a range of decent basics that you can date a night in and that are, are useful. So, um, okay, so that's that one. Next one, I know from following your story, you've had quite a few challenges in staying true to your values and it's made me feel even more committed to supporting you. Thank you. Have you generally found your transparency with your customers has worked in your favor? Yes, absolutely. And brings me to my almost toughest moment this year, which was just devastating. So at the end or early this year, um, I told you the story about the hooks and eyes and the company in France and stopping production because of the polyester sewing thread. Early this year, I was sent a hook and eye piece from my factory, which hadn't been sewn around the edges. It had been dyed and it hadn't been sewed. And inside I saw a little piece of white and I had no idea what that was. And when I took it out, it's actually a piece of some kind of plastic. And I emailed the factory in France and said, what's this? And they said, it's a piece of polypropylene. We, we put it in everything. And I said, but I, can have no, I can't have any plastic. I, I sent you the thing, we sent you uh, the tensile sewing thread to say we can't have polyester and he came back and said to me oh don't worry it's not polyester it's um polypropylene it should be fine <laughs> and that was um that was an eye-opener to how 
the organizations we deal with don't even think twice about putting something synthetic into a product. It doesn't even break mentioning. They're so unaware, many people, of, of what they're actually doing and what we're trying to, to achieve here in this world. But after that, I knew that I'd sold 2,000 bras to people as 100% zero waste and fully compostable. And actually, there was this tiny three-centimeter three square piece of um, polypropylene in the hook and eye. So I, I was almost sick. I, I couldn't even tell my partner for a week. I was so shocked. I, eventually, I wrote an email, and um, I had to go out while I sent the email. I, I couldn't even bear the responses coming back. I went out and had a gelato on the beach and just thought, this is the end. I actually did think about closing the company down. It was so upsetting for me. Then I sent out this email, and the most amazing thing happened, and I have them here. I've printed them off. Over 60 people emailed back and just really supported me in what I was doing and said that you know my transparency was what made them trust the brand even more. My fear was that how could people trust me after I'd done this? And the reality is that you, if you admit to your mistakes, people actually, in the end, will trust you more. So it was so humbling and an enormous lesson. Um, that I'm very grateful for. So I'm still upset about the hooks and eyes. And that's been another issue for me with COVID in that I was looking for a new supplier, but I, because my, my hook and eye factory in France has actually now started making face masks. There is no one open to help me with this problem right now. So I'm going to have to wait till that, that whole thing ends and we can actually get back to production. Although I have got a local sewer, we're going to have a go at manufacturing some here in Sydney and see if that will work. Um, so next question, I keep on coming. Emma, in your fabrics and material research, did you happen to come across compostable product or material that will be waterproof or water repelling? I have been sent some of these materials and I am aware of them, um, but they're not relevant to what I do because you, I want my products to breathe. Um, and that's again, the beauty of a natural fiber that, um, that we, we want to be able to breathe in it, sweat in it, we want it to dry out quickly. Tensile is quicker drying, uh, cotton is a, is a slower drying material, but we certainly want that, that uh, moisture to go out. And that's the whole issue with, you know, going through, going through breast cancer and radiotherapy, you've got to let heat get out because there's a lot of burning going on there. So that was the whole, the genesis of it. Emma, if you want to email me separately, I might have some ideas for you if you're looking for, for something like that for yourself. Um, Simone. Uh, you mentioned issues with transparency. Will emerging technologies like EchoScore and blockchain help with solving this challenge for businesses like yours and consumers? Um, absolutely. I think, you know, I'm excited that these things are um, coming around and, and um, I'm pretty confident of, of where my things come from because I'm so tiny. But I think for larger businesses, um, if they can identify the you know, the, the complete supply chain uh, of where everything's come from, that's, that's just going to be such a powerful thing. And I think also in terms of getting to the point where we can actually, we can actually break down materials. So if we know exactly what's in it, um, we can actually then recycle products that have multiple, um, multiple materials in there once we know exactly what they're in and where they're from. So I'm excited for Echo School because I think, you know, what, what's been hard for me as the only brand who's really making something, you know, compostable and, and zero waste, apart from that hook and eye, um, is that you're, you're then um, sort of judged against the companies that work with fair trade factories. And I'm unable to make a product with a fair trade factory because bra making is a very technical is a very technical thing. It's like comparing apples and oranges. So I need somebody who can grade um, a bra size in 27 sizes. There are millimetres, millimetres involved. And again, the product has to be right. I can't compromise on the product. It has to be as good as a, a, um, a regular commercial product. And, and so I need to use factories that are very technical and those are not factories in Australia, unfortunately. Our, our lingerie industry went offshore when, when bonds shut down and went offshore. We don't really have the machines. We don't really have the expertise. So with something like EchoScore, I think it gives um, different weightings to, to, to different things. And if you're not able to produce in a fair trade factory, but you do all these other things on the other side, I think there's a fairer system of rating for somebody like me who, 
who has not been able to, but hopefully now can with Sri Lanka, straddle all of those particular things. Um, thank you. So going to, to now to Jane. Um, yes, so back onto that question um, of um, production here possible. It, I think I've, I've kind of answered that. Um, it's just really hard. We have machinery in lingerie that we don't use for anything else, not even swimwear. So we've got a lot of good swimwear manufacturing going on here. Um, we need a twin needle and we need a, a zigzag. Uh, but we also need real technical expertise in ensuring that when we do those 27 um, sizes, the, 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 the sizing is absolutely 100% accurate. Millimeters here, millimeters there will make a difference. I would love to set up a factory here. I'd love to find a ground, you know, particularly now this virus has hit. My favorite um, pattern maker has now lost her job. Sorry, my favorite sample maker who worked full time for another brand has now lost her job and she's available. I would love to be able to work with her and other small factories I know that have, have lost business and to, to get them making lingerie here again in Australia. But they would need a grant to do that. And also because I don't come from a lingerie brand myself and I don't have a 20 year history in designing and making bras, I come to this as a frustrated consumer, really in 2014, 2015. I just don't have the, the skill level myself to do that, but I, I would love to do it. And particularly also because the cost of, although well, it's very expensive to make here, the cost of freight has gone up astronomically. You know, people are paying $50 a kilo to ship or to air freight uh, materials around the world. And once you take off the freight costs, it allows you more to build into um, what, you, what you can pay to a local factory. So I would love to do more. I make my sleepwear here. I'm probably gonna make my undies here. Um, so yeah, I will do as much as I can. I think that might be it. Thank you. <laughs> I've got a couple now. Let me just um, unshare your screen. If okay. I... Oh, there we go. And I think, ah, oh, yes, we have Scott. Let's let Scott, let's see if Scott can do a takeover as cleverly. Okay. You. Oh, there he is. <laughs> <There's> <laughs> Scott. <laughs> Welcome, Scott. Um, Takeover. <laughs> um, Stephanie um, sabotaged the beer man's presentation with her bras. So. I might have seen that pop up. <laughs> um, Stephanie, just one more question before um, uh, we just check in with uh, Scott. Um, one thing you mentioned, which I think um, you've done many times and I think could be of real value to um, uh, other smaller eco businesses in particular. You're a serial crowdfunder, and so I think you've really taken that model and made it your business yeah. and, um, and turned it into, you effectively made crowdfunding a zero waste retail business and, and you know, a low risk business. So yeah. can you just elaborate on that? Because I, I just think it's very clever and something of great interest to people. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, I, I've been through, you know, one of the things I've learned having lost businesses in the past is that, you know, we can kind of rush into a situation with a backer. Um, and it, if you don't work out that backer relationship very early on, it can, can really backfire and I don't want to lose any more businesses. So, so crowdfunding for me is a way to, um, to engage people with the brand. Um, it also means that you're, you know, you're generally creating more awareness through that pre- you know, pre-sell period. Um, and it allows me to just raise enough to, to buy materials to get that into, into production. Um, and, you know, it, it's, ended up being, it's ended up being a fabulous thing. I haven't had to, to rely on other sources of income. And, and what I do is very capital intensive. You know, the materials are so expensive. I have no credit terms with these businesses because I'm not a big business. So I have to pay upfront for everything. I often have to pay surcharges. So um, crowdfunding has, has helped me do that. But also, you know, what you learn in your first crowdfund, and I sold 745 bras or something, is that you only make what you sell. It's, it's fantastic. There's nothing left at the end of it. People are capable. I mean, that's also the downside. People come to you and say, I'd like to buy a bra. And you say, well, I actually don't have any left. Um, so that can be the downside if you can't make enough to, um, to, to have stock there when, when other people go. But I think it's a great 
idea, you know, for any business to, to build your audience. And it was good the first time with Kickstarter because it is a global thing, but there are a lot of hidden costs in, in those sorts of things. And you, you've just got to be wary of those, but it is a great marketing strategy with one of the big global ones. And it's one that's really seen me, seen me through. And as I get a little bit bigger and as my sales get stronger, I can make more of my own stock myself. So I, I make what people have I've ordered and then I can make between 50 and 100 percent extra on top of that that I can that I can sell online so yeah I, I love it as a methodology it means that it's you know drop shipping and wholesaling is harder um, but that will just be something I, I do along the line I think again when you start a business you think I've got to have a I've got to have a backer and I've got to be able to wholesale and actually you don't you can just grow it organically and, and let it develop its own life and, and crowdfunding is a great way to to be able to do that now you call it crowdfunding but is it actually are you using crowdfunding platforms to do it or are you no. mimicking what is a crowdfund yeah. yeah i'm mimicking it i call it a pre-sale um when i when i launched the the peach bar i did actually put a crowdfund app into the website so that we had a counter and you could see if it was getting to the goal I'm not necessarily sure those things really really motivated I, I don't know but really it's a pre-sale and we've got enough people now that are that are buyers and enough people on a mailing list um, and a reasonable following on social media that we we can get it out to enough people that that we need to um, in that and as I say I've, I've got a very loyal following um, because there isn't another product like this on the market um, I've got a very loyal following and they 50% of them will rebuy another bar or buy two, you know, when they come back. So people tend to buy more when they come back. So I'm, I'm very lucky. And um, just before we do, um, we, we shift to uh, in, in bulk, Scott, do you, um, do you foresee competitors coming in from the broader market? Yeah, it's, it's, I'm often asked this and I, I'm kind of surprised people don't do it, but I'm also not surprised with the bigger brands. And I've been approached once before by a bigger brand, but I think it's really hard given how toxic a bar actually is and how many horrible materials are in it. I think it can just shine a really, really negative light on the rest of your business. So if you say, oh, here's our green product, it's the very good bar, it's completely compostable, it's this, it's that. And then you've got a, you know, ninety-nine percent of your product range is actually made of polyester and nylon. Um, it's really hard to to reconcile those two things, and I think that's that is a barrier. Um, I think what the bigger brands will do and are starting to do more is use recycled products, and I'd quite like to do that down the line because limitations are there in terms of materials you can use. Uh, to make something pretty. I'm, I'm so excited by the Liberty fabric because that is pretty. But there are great recycled laces. There are great least recycled meshes. They're all synthetic. They're all polyester. My preference is to stay away from it. But um, I think some of the bigger brands will start to use some of those more recycled materials, which is great because we are not creating virgin plastics in that sense and we're not creating nitrous oxide. Um, so... Yeah, I'm surprised not to have seen more. And I think for the smaller brands, it's just how do you get going, you know, to make lots of sizes. People do small, medium and large and, and that's fine, but they're not creating that bigger size range. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, so, Scott, um, as, as the only Australian manufacturer of compostable bags, um, do you have um, anything you wanted to run past Stephanie? Um. I'm not sure bras are really my expertise. Manufacturing, I can assist on. Um, yeah, yeah manuf manufacturing locally is hard. Yeah, it's really hard. Um, mm -hmm. I suppose the silver lining that's coming out of the current environment is there's a real flavour for Australian mate. Yeah. Um, so there, I think there are, there's opportunities now and the opportunities will also increase more in the future as everyone looks to become more self-sufficient, even countries. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I agree. Very good point. Um, Stephanie, just in wrapping, um, what would what are the main things you'd like to leave us with? Oh, look, I think um, you know, just the you know the inspiration that we're all seeing today. I mean, you know, just I think I think you know from my perspective, it's it's buy less, buy better, and there are always great options out there when you uh, when you look around. You know, I, I'm a convert in the last. 12 months to a thick soap bars. Once you start, you don't stop. There are little solutions out there. I, I haven't really used a plaster for a long time, but I'll definitely be buying a patch. You know, there are little solutions out there to all sorts of problems. 
you just got to look at them. You just got to look for them. You find them and just every time buy less, buy better and make sure that you're making the right choice in terms of materials. Well, thank you so much for all the work that you do. And may you sell a million bras and keep a million out of land, others out of landfill. Um, thank you, Stephanie, very much. Um, I hope you stay around and um, um, ask Scott some provoking questions. I will. <laughs> now, Scott